Good morning. We are reading from Galatians 2, verses 15 and 16. And if you are able, would you please stand for the reading of the word? Thank you. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we are just getting started in the uh, epistle of Galatians. And if you want to turn to chapter 1, uh, you were in chapter 2, go back one chapter. Uh, last week was the introduction, and we really talked about the Apostle Paul and the uniqueness of his calling and what he, who he was called to reach. And he was the missionary to the Gentile world and uh, did a tremendous job, probably the greatest missionary that's ever lived. And, and uh, Peter was the missionary to the Jews. His message was to the Jewish audience, where Paul's message was primarily to a, Gala to a Greek audience and a Gentile audience. So we covered a lot of ground last week. I'm not going to go back uh, other than to say that God knew what he was doing when he chose Paul to be the one to speak to the Gentiles. Paul was a Jew. His parents were Jewish, and, and so he was raised in that Jewish faith. But they lived in a Gentile part of the world, in Cilicia, in that region. And so he was from Tarsus. And, and so his friends, his acquaintances in the community would have, been, would have been Gentiles. And so he saw both worlds. He lived in one in his home, and then he was able to go out, and he understood the Greek uh, culture, the influence of Alexander the Great from when he was in power, and, uh, and so Paul was uniquely equipped. And then, of course, when he came to the age to go to university, uh, and they went to university much younger in that day than they do now, uh, Paul was sent by his father down to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel, one of the great uh, teachers, rabbis of the day. And so he was properly trained in Hebrew and in the culture of the Hebrews. Of course, he grew up in it, so he already knew some of it, but he had to study the entire Old Testament under Gamaliel. And, and of course, uh, his name at that time that he went by was Saul, and that was his Jewish name. And of course, Saul became a, uh, a, a persecutor of Christians. And uh, Jesus had an encounter with Saul on the road to Damascus. He was heading to Damascus to persecute Christians. He had letters from the Jewish council to go there and round up the Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem and throw them in prison. And he was on his way, and Jesus shows up, knocks him down with a great light, blinds him, and the first words out of Paul, Saul's mouth were, Lord, who are you? Well, he got the Lord right, right? And he said, who are you? And the response was, Jesus of Nazareth. I'm the one whom you've been persecuting. And all of a sudden, for the first time in his life, he thought he was persecuting these Christians who were wrong, that he was right in the Jewish faith. And all of a sudden, he learns that God is saying, you've been persecuting me. And this transformed him, and he was saved, and he went off, and for a number of years, he was trained by certain people that God brought into his pathway, one of them being Peter later. 
And, and then his ministry, I mean, he also ministered while he was, he was actually on the job training. He was ministering to people, going to the synagogues and teaching Christ from the Old Testament Scripture to the Jews. But uh, this was his ministry, and he was perfectly equipped. He changed his name from Saul, the Jewish, to Paul, because now his ministry is to the Gentiles. And the interesting thing about uh, uh, Paul is Jesus let him know from the beginning what his ministry would encompass. He said, you need to tell him, told Ananias, please tell him that he will suffer many things for my name's sake. So this is not going to be an easy journey for Paul. And of course, we know that he landed in Rome finally for the second time, and there his body was severed uh, from his head and... Uh, he died a martyr's death. This was a man who was committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. And let me read for you verses 1 through 9. Last week we really talked about verses 1 through 5, and we'll focus solely on 6 through 9, but I want to lay the context for it, so let's read the whole thing, starting at verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, notice plural, churches, uh, all of Paul's letters except this one were written to one church in a particular community, the church at Ephesus, the church uh, at uh, Colossae. This is to several churches in that region. And so he, he says uh, uh, to the churches uh, of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. And now we get to the text. I am astonished, right out of the gate now, look what he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again. By the way, in Jewish language, when something is repeated, it's speaking of emphasis. It's important. Remember Jesus would say, Verily, verily, I say to you. That is, that is em he's emphatically saying, listen to what I'm about to say. So here Paul is going to say again, he's, he's repeating for emphasis, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now, already in the first nine verses of this letter, we get a sense of, of the concern that Paul has for the churches in Galatia. First of all, in verse 1, it shows up in the greeting. He says, Paul, an apostle. And then a side note. Not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Paul gives such clarity in the qualification of his apostleship. Why did Paul feel the need to qualify himself in that way? It's a good question. We're going to get to the answer. Then in verse 6, we see more concern. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So early in the letter, we learn of Paul's concern. I want you to notice he isn't asking the Galatians a question here. He isn't saying... It's come to me that you've turned. Is that true? Uh-uh. He has evidence. I don't know how. Probably someone, a messenger, came to Paul with great concern for what he experienced in Galatia. Maybe it was a letter that was sent to the Apostle Paul by those concerned Christians in the churches. 
But he has evidence because he makes a statement of accusation. He's calling out the believers who are causing confusion in the church and are deserting the true gospel. The word in the Greek for deserting is used for a military term or a military desertion, okay? Which, by the way, is punishable by death. This is very serious stuff, and Paul is very serious in his approach here. The word in the Greek for deserting is used for a military desertion. And, and the indication here is that the Galatians, the believers in the churches, were voluntarily deserting grace in order to pursue legalism taught by false teachers that had come into the church. They were going back into living by the law and not living by grace. Really, this is the underpinning of Paul's letter. He is the whole, if you want to know what's, what's the doctrine, the doctrine that Paul is really teaching throughout the book of Galatians, it's this, justification by faith. We're not justified in our salvation by our works, but by the work of Jesus. Amen? So in verse 7, so first in verse 1, he shows concern. In verse 6, he shows concern. And then verse 7, the latter part of the verse, there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Here Paul identifies false teachers. Now let me explain who these people are that have come into the church. They're called Judaizers. They're actually those who claim to be saved. They actually came from Jerusalem. They are very familiar with the teachings of Peter, James, and John, who are the leaders now of the church in Jerusalem, James being probably the, the pastor. And, and they are coming to the people. Interestingly, false teachers are not on the outside of the church. False shepherds, false teachers, they're inside the church. It was true in that day, and it's true in this day. And, and we see here, they are saying that faith in Christ isn't enough. They're causing mass confusion to the believers that were trained and taught under Paul. They're, they're, they're saying that uh, you, you need to keep the Jewish laws, the Mosaic laws, the ceremonial laws. You need to practice Sabbath keeping. You, you need to be circumcised. They're telling these Gentiles, you, you say you're saved, but you're not fully saved yet until you begin to live by Torah, the Old Testament law. So they're adding to the gospel. And they're maligning the good name of the Apostle Paul. It's not, just, it's not just the gospel that they're maligning. They're coming after the one who is Jesus' apostle. Remember now, we looked at it last week. Jesus called Paul to the ministry. Jesus gave him apostleship. That was one of the criteria to be an apostle in the Bible. You had to walk with Jesus. You had to know Jesus. He did. On the road to Damascus, Jesus showed up. Interestingly enough, when Paul went to Jerusalem to meet with the council, and the Jerusalem council, the, I'm talking about the Christian council, it would have been Peter, James, and John. And they all gathered with Paul, who had been out uh, sharing Christ with Gentiles, and they all met together. And there was a great concern that they had. The concern was that there are these Judaizers who are going into the churches where the gospel has been preached and people have been saved, and they're saved by the grace of God, not by the works of man. And, and they're going in and they're adding extra things. They're saying to these believers, you're not really a believer yet. You're not circumcised yet. You're not, you're not following the Mosaic law as you should. And so these guys met together in Jerusalem, and Paul is the one who spoke up and said, 
fellas, let me just tell you what Christ revealed to me by way of the gospel and what I've been sharing with everyone that I meet out in the, in, in, in the Gentile world. And he shared the message of the gospel with the Peter, James, and John. And they agreed with him. And they all together said, we're going to send a letter out to all the Gentile churches and let them know not to worry about what these Judaizers are saying. You don't need that to be saved. That's not part of salvation at all. But see, the, here's how false teachers work in churches. They, they don't come directly and say, well, that guy that's been preaching, man, he's a false, he's, he's saying all kinds of things that aren't biblical, and he's messing up the whole thing, and you guys need, you know, you, they don't do that. You know what they do? They bring suspicion. They'll say, uh, what, wasn't he the pastor that was uh, let go of another church. Uh, the message, you're listening to the message from somebody like that. They're just raising suspicion, raising question. That's, that's what they do. And, and, and once they get people to now discount that leader that is sharing the gospel, then they start to change the gospel to what they want. Th this is the way it works, and it happens in churches everywhere all the time. That you have to first deify, or not deify, but you have to Satanize a leader, and then you tear down what the leader has been teaching even if the leader is simply trying to teach the Bible. And people begin to question. Well, maybe he's right. Man, I never thought of it that way. And before you know it, people are now doing jumping through hoops to be saved. We, we need to be careful of that in our day. I want to talk to you about it. Because I think there's a great concern today. Boy, if Paul could just write a letter to the churches today. I, I want to say, first of all, though, before I go into this concern that I have. And by the way, the, it, I'm, it's not a concern with Vero Bible. It's not that. Oh, I'm concerned generally. I don't want to see it happen here. But it's not because there's something going on. Uh, it's not that at all. But it is a big concern in the body of Christ in North America. But before we go there, I want you to know what Paul taught as the gospel. Okay? So uh, if you really want to know what Paul was about, uh, if you look at Scripture, you'll find that Paul talked about a gospel that never changes. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not uh, adapt to different societies, different cultures, different periods of time in history. It is continuously the same. The first thing Paul establishes in his preaching is that there is only one gospel. There, he even said it here, there is no other gospel, even though they're preaching another gospel, but really, quite honestly, there is none. There's one one gospel, and, and, there, and, and there are counterfeits that add to and take from that one gospel, but they're not the gospel. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is not a developing or changing gospel. It's not adaptable. It doesn't evolve. It's not driven by social change. It's not open to varying interpretations by different church affiliations. It's not like, well, one denomination sees the gospel this way, and this other denomination, they have it a little differently. Somebody doesn't have a gospel, if that's the case. There's only one gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is immutable. 
It's unchangeable. It's undisputable. It's unalterable. It's permanent. It hasn't changed an iota from before time began when the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. The gospel's been the gospel for all time. And by the way, did you hear what I just said? It's found, take your Bible and turn, I want you to turn to this one. In Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, we'll just look at two verses, 7 and 8. Revelation 13, 7, now let me just set it up for you so you know what's going on here. It, John is seeing a vision and, and he writes what he sees and he's speaking of this antichrist who would rise up in the great tribulation. John saw that the beast, the antichrist, and here it is in verse 7, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And that's happening today, by the way. There are saints around the globe who are losing their life because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know that. I know that. It's only going to get worse. And authority, look what it says, and authority was given to this Antichrist over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. As believers, your name was written in the book of life not when you got saved. It was in the book of life before God created anything. Bef it doesn't say from the foundation of the world. It says before the foundation of the world. God knew you. God chose you. That just blows my mind. What an awesome God. Talk about security in my salvation. And, and he goes a little further here, and he talks more about how, if it were possible, Satan would fool, would deceive even the very elect. But it's not possible. Those who God has chosen will not be truly chosen. They're not going to be deceived. Those who are playing a game, a religious game, acting as if they're saved, they can be fooled. They, they will bow down and worship Antichrist in the end. We're starting to see that now in this world. We're seeing churches that are now shifting away from the truth of God's word. Now they are warming up to the woke mentality out there. They're, they're warming up to gender changes, fluidity, and all of this stuff. They're changing. You know why? Because they were never with us. If they had been with us, they would have never left us. I'm telling you right now, the true church of Jesus Christ believes the one true gospel. It never changes, and they never change. They're saved. And, and what's really amazing and mind-boggling to me in this text is this. God's talking about the lamb that was slain before he created Adam and Eve and they sinned. He sees everything. He is sovereign. He already knew you before the foundation of the world, and he already had the plan in place for his son, Jesus, to die for you. If that doesn't want to make you shout, I just woke somebody up. Good. Man, I get excited when I think about how far God is ahead of me. Mm. So according to God's eternal purpose before creation, the death of Christ was already purposed by God to seal the redemption of those who are saved forever. And the Antichrist can't do nothing about it. 
But Paul is worked up here because the gospel of Christ is under attack from within the church. And his apostleship is being called into question. How do false teachers do it? With question. Just raise suspicion. Don't attack the person directly. Just ask questions. I wonder why. And people start going, hmm. Yeah, you make a point. Before you know it, you're being deceived. You're, 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 you're experiencing what Paul warned the church of in Corinth. You know what he said? But I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve with his craftiness, that you might also be led astray from the simple and pure devotion to Christ. The gospel's not complicated. And when someone comes to you and they start trying to complicate it and make you jump through certain hoops and do certain things, that's a fair warning. This is not the gospel. Does that make sense? So this has been Satan's strategy going all the way back to the days of Jesus walking on the earth. And, and, and he uses these false leaders to do it. They asked John the Baptist why he was baptizing people down at the Jordan River. They said, who gave you the authority to do this? They're just raising questions. You know good and well that John was the final, the last prophet he was doing what he was doing under the leadership of God. Who's giving you authority? The chief priests, the scribes, they did the same thing to Jesus in Luke 20, verses 1 and 2. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things, or who is it that gave you this authority? They didn't attack him, just in front of all the people. Where did you get the authority to teach this thing you're teaching? And people are like, ooh, yeah, that's a fair question. Peter and John, they healed the blind man at the temple gate. Or the lame man. He wasn't blind, he was lame. He rises up. He's dancing around. People who've always known him to be a beggar right outside the temple gate, beautiful. Now all of a sudden they see this man dancing around. He's shouting for joy and people are getting excited. Next thing you know, the very next day, the chief priest and all of his cohorts, I mean the whole bunch of them. Look In Acts 4, if you want to write it down, Acts chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. Let me read it for you. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly family. And when they had set Peter and John in the midst of them, they inquired, here it is, by what authority or by what name did you do this? Raise suspicion. Raise question. It can be something as simple as attending a Sunday school class where the, old, the end game of that class in Bible study is to read the text and then ask questions. I wonder if he meant this, or maybe he meant that. You just raise questions. There's no absolute truth to it. False teachers don't want you to walk in absolute truth. They work for Satan. And it's interesting also about false teachers. They never evangelize. They don't spend any time trying to win lost people to Jesus. They spend all their time in the church trying to shake and rattle believers and this is what Paul is dealing with with the churches in Galatia. So what about his message of the gospel? Well, Romans 1.16, this is Paul. This is what he said to the Christians in Rome. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation 
to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, not from works to works. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul's sharing the gospel. He's pretty clear, isn't he? There's not two different ways to look at it. It's one way. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul shares the gospel with the church in Corinth. Listen to what he says. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as, listen now, this is really good. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. I didn't give you my thoughts and my opinions on what the gospel is. I gave you what Jesus gave me. And then he goes into it. He gets very clear here. He said that, G, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and to the 12 disciples. This is the gospel, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and what it represents, that Jesus atoned for our sins. He became the sacrifice for our sins. It was a substitutionary atonement that Jesus died in our place. That's the gospel. The, the work of the gospel is Jesus' work, not our work. All we can do is have faith in Jesus. Amen? Now more about the Judaizers. So they're this group of believers who still hold tightly to these legalistic practices in Judaism, okay? The Judaizers were Jews or they were converted Jews or converted Gentiles who still practiced the rituals of Judaism. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? Remember him? Remember when he came up from Ethiopia during Passover to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. So here's an Ethiopian traveling all the way to Jerusalem practicing Judaism, and he's a Gentile. There were those people that, at that time. But when you, after Christ dies on the cross and becomes the substitute for your, sin, for your sins, you, don't, you no longer have to meet the, Ju the Judaism rules, the law, the legalism. You don't have to meet that any longer. So, so this message that these Judaizers have is that a Gentile cannot be a worshiper of God unless they become a Jew. That's the bottom line. And, and that message caught the attention of the church, churches in Galatia. So Paul addresses the issue of salvation by works. Interesting. Now, I want to focus in here on an issue that I see happening today that is a, I mean, it's a spitting image of what Paul was addressing with Judaizers in his day. It's a group that is known as Hebrew Roots Movement, HRM. Go home and Google it. HRM, Hebrew Roots Movement. Sometimes they go by Jewish Roots Movement. I want to share some, some excerpts for you from a wonderful website that talks about HRM. Go to gotquestions.org, gotquestions.org, and look it up for yourself. It is likely that you know someone who has been deceived and taken by these modern-day Judaizers. But let me read some excerpts from, from gotquestions.org. The, the premise of HRM is the belief that the church has veered far from the true teachings and Hebrew concepts of the Bible. 
The movement maintains that Christianity has been indoctrinated with the culture and beliefs of Greek and Roman philosophy that ultimately biblical Christianity taught in churches today has been corrupted with a pagan imitation of the New Testament Gospels. They, it, they despise the Bible that you and I use that is written in Greek. That's a fallen culture. They think that they actually believe that there is an original manuscript in Hebrew for the New Testament, which there is not. Jesus, in the day of Jesus, they spoke predominantly Aramaic, but Jesus also knew the Greek. Why? Why did Paul preach and speak in Greek language? Because that was the language of the day. And by the way, it's just interesting how God would choose when to send Jesus at a time after Alexander the Great conquered the known world and the Greek culture had literally invaded everywhere, including Rome. And Paul is well-versed in the Greek language and understanding the Greek culture. And by the way, the Greek language, it is far more uh, expansive than even the English language. How many words do we have for love in the English language? You know how many there are for love in the Greek language? Seven words. Each has a unique aspect of love. So when did God introduce the New Testament to us? When the language was so expansive that it could speak more directly and clearly to what the gospel is saying. Yet these folks in the Hebrew roots are just turned off by the Greek language. Okay, going further, those of the Hebrew Roots Movement hold to the teaching that Christ's death on the cross did not end the Mosaic Covenant, but instead it actually renewed the covenant, which is not true. When Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law but fulfill it, what that actually means is I came to continue in me, not you. I am the fulfillment, not just now, I will always be, going forward, the fulfillment of the law, okay? Not that we're going to fulfill the law. He did it for us, amen? Aren't you glad for that? They teach that the understanding of the New Testament can only come from a Hebrew perspective and that the teachings of the Apostle Paul are not understood clearly. They, they, they do not like Paul. You know why? Because he body slams their false teaching. So what do you do when you've got somebody who's preaching accurately the absolute truth of the gospel and that goes against your false teaching? You have to demonize that man. You have to raise questions about him so that people will now listen to what you have to say even though it's false. Many affirm the existence of an original Hebrew language in the New Testament, and in some cases, they denigrate the existing New Testament written in Greek. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and say it because I've talked to a couple different Hebrew Roots folks. They, not, not all Hebrew Roots people believe this, but there are those that do. They literally believe that the Torah is greater than the New Testament. Now, I'm going to just tell you right now, the Old and New Testament are both important. You don't put one over the other. The Old Testament is the New Testament in a concealed manner. The New Testament is the Old Testament now revealed. The fulfillment of everything the Old Testament talks about through symbols and types is Jesus Christ in the New Testament. This is the symbol. This is the shadow. The New Testament, it's the substance. You, no way you can say that the Torah takes precedent over the New Testament. That's ridiculous. Although there are many variations of Hebrew roots, they all adhere to a common emphasis on recovering the original Jewishness of Christianity. Now, you're going to hear me say this. Please hear what I'm saying. 
I think it, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with trying to understand uh, the Old Testament and the Jewish laws and ceremonial laws and sacrificial laws and all, all the, it, know it, study it. Because it's a shadow of what you have now. It'll just make this even more meaningful, right? I, I've, I've attended a Jewish Seder meal with my wife. I, I, I would recommend that you do that. We went to one down in Palm Beach. It was Rush Limbaugh's insurance agent uh, in Palm Beach. His wife, under Donald Trump, became the ambassador to Costa Rica. So this was an influential uh, Jewish family in Palm Beach, and our daughter went to school with their daughter, and so uh, they invited us to come to their Jewish Seder meal. And I'm going to tell you right now, I thought I was in a Woody Allen film. I'm, I didn't know if I should laugh or cry, but it, it, was, just, uh, it was just this going through the motions that I knew that we were in for a time when, in, at the beginning, uh, he looked at the crowd, and there's people there, Jews from everywhere. And he, he said, do we want the, he's talking about the Seder meal. He goes, all right, you guys want the long version or the short version? <laughs> and right next to him is this, this neurosurgeon from New York. He goes, the short version, I've got surgery tomorrow morning. That's what he said. We, wow. But I, I'm thankful that I did that. And we befriended them. They're friends to this day. But, but I'm going to tell you right now, uh, knowing about Jewish history, experiencing some of that is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. As long as you know the difference between what is under the law and what is under grace. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of grace, not law. The scripture says, the law killeth, but the spirit brings life. Amen? Well, I could go further, but I'm not for sake of time. Well, maybe a little further. Hebrew roots groups are often made up of a majority of Gentiles, including Gentile rabbis. What is a Gentile rabbi? Really? And by the way, if you have Gentile friends who are part of the HRM, they actually believe they have been made Jewish. They think they're Jewish. Many of them will not refer to to Jesus by that name. To them, he is Yeshua. I had someone look me in the eye and they were serious as a heart attack and asked, would you please stop using the name Jesus when you preach? His name is Yeshua. And he actually said, I made sure that my children, that they were saved by Yeshua and not by Jesus. And I, I said, wait, okay, let me see. You're telling me that every person that's ever come to Jesus Christ when Billy Graham shared the gospel, they're not really saved because they prayed to Jesus. He goes, well, I think you've got to be careful. Okay, that's, that's legalism. Let me say it a different way. That is bondage. That is not freedom in Christ. Colossians 2.16 says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Romans 14, 5, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in their own mind. The Bible's not calling you into a legalistic, hoop-jumping experience to be saved. Scripture clearly indicates that these issues are a matter of personal choice. 
These verses and many others give clear evidence that the Mosaic covenant laws and ordinances have ended. Continuing to teach that the Old Testament is still in effect in spite of what the New Testament teaches or twisting the New Testament to agree with the Hebrew roots beliefs is false teaching at best and heretical at worst. Church, as a shepherd, one of the shepherds of this flock, we as shepherds have great concern that our fellowship not be taken by these false teachers and this false doctrine. Let's make Christ the center. Let's make the one true gospel the focus. Let's be committed to a simple and pure devotion to Christ. Father, thank you this morning for your goodness that you would open the scripture to us, that you would enlighten us, you would illuminate our hearts to receive the teaching of the truth. We believe that the Bible is authoritative. We believe that it is absolute truth. It never changes. It's immutable. While change happens all around us every day, and we love every single person regardless of what change they believe in, it's not a question of that. It's we love everyone, but we will not change the message of the gospel. Paul said that it has the power to save those who believe. So we continue to believe it. We continue to share it the way Jesus gave it. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Good to see all of you today and thank you for being here. If you today have been caught up in any kind of uh, Hebrew roots or anything else and you'd like to talk to an elder uh, we are available come and see us we can talk uh, brother Marshall led worship he's one of our elders Scott Walker played the guitar he's one of our elders that are present today so uh, Brenton's here but I'm, we're kind of taking it easy on Brenton uh, he's kind of on downtime right now and we're thankful that he gets that opportunity but let's uh, let's make sure that we follow the one true and living God. Amen? God bless you.